Folks, it's good to be together again in our homes on a Sunday morning, uh, worshipping God. Uh, you're very welcome. As I said before, whoever you are and wherever you are from, if you're looking in, we're glad you're joining with us in our church family in Town Hill Presbyterian to worship God together today. I should say to your own folks, if you have any prayer requests, please do send them to me. You can email me or text me or whatever way sit yourself and I'll collate those and make sure that they are circulated to the congregation. But as we come to worship God together today, let's hear from his word, some lovely words from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. And the psalmist continues right throughout that psalm with this wonderful refrain, his steadfast love endures forever. So we're going to come now and worship God together as we pray. Let's come before God in prayer. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your steadfast love. That love which is not fickle. That love which is sure. That love which lasts forever. Lord God, you are our maker. You are the provider and the protector of our lives. It's because we are alive that we can gather together to worship your great name. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life, physical and spiritual. We thank you for the blessings of common grace. Thank you that in your great love, in your great compassion, that you shower goodness on all people. We thank you, Lord God, for the blessing of special grace. That grace which breaks down the barrier between us as sinful people and you as a holy God. We thank you that by that special grace we are brought into a, a new standing, a new relationship with you. Lord we thank you for the grace you have given to us to gather together today in worship. This is the reason you have created us to worship and to praise you throughout our whole existence. And Holy Spirit, we ask today that you will strengthen us to worship you with the Father and the Son. And may we know the blessings of true worship. We praise and adore you. Accept our thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first praise, which talks about the holiness of God, this great God who is absolutely holy yet who can be known by us. Let's use these words to praise God together. Who 
Jesus commands all the hosts of heaven. Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What of the beauty demands such praises? What of the splendor outshines the sun? What of the majesty rules with justice? Well, today we're looking at uh, Psalm 34, and this psalm is one of those psalms whose historical background is known to us. The heading of the psalm says this, 
of David when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech who drove him away and he left. And the story behind this psalm is found in 1 Samuel chapter 21. But we need to go back a little further to get the whole picture. You will know of course that David had become famous as the young man who killed the Philistine giant Goliath. And in many other military successes. And he became a bit of a celebrity in Israel. And there was even a song written about him which you can read there in 1st Samuel chapter 21 and because of David's fame and David's success King Saul became very jealous of David and, and he became increasingly angry so angry in fact that on a number of occasions he tried to kill David and David was forced to flee the country. And where did he run to? Well, he ran to the last place you would expect him to run to. He ran to the court of the king of the Philistines, a man called Abimelech, or as he is called in 1 Samuel, Achish. They couldn't stay in Israel because he was facing certain death at the hands of Saul. So he ran to his arch enemy, the Philistines. And if that weren't bad enough, he went to uh, Philistia carrying the sword of the giant Goliath. Now he must have been very desperate to do that, to run to the Philistines. And uh, actually we're told in uh, 1 Samuel that David was very afraid. In fact, Psalm 56 shows us just how afraid he was because Psalm 56 was written about this time. Uh, David was running to the Philistines and he was expecting to die at the hands of the Philistines. So what does he do? He comes up with a plan. He decides to play it being insane and it works. And so the Philistines let David go. So we're going to read Psalm uh, 34. But, but maybe before we do that we'll read just uh, one or two verses from 1 Samuel chapter 21. Reading from verses 10 to the end of the chapter. And this is entitled David flees to Gath. And Gath is simply another name for Philistia, the home of the Philistines. So let's read uh, 1 Samuel 21 at verse 10. This is God's word. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behaviour before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, 
Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen? That you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And then we'll uh, just flick over to Psalm uh, 34. <clears throat> Psalm 34. And we'll read together the whole of the chapter 22 uh, verses. In fact, um, it's not apparent in our English translations, but every um, verse here in Psalm 34 begins with a subsequent letter in the Hebrew alphabet. But let's read together Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Girls and boys, I hope you have been enjoying this lovely weather. Uh, maybe you have been in the garden or maybe you haven't 
Govan Garden. Maybe you've just gone for a walk, but I hope you're enjoying this lovely weather we're having at the moment. Now today, I have a question for you. I won't be able to hear your answers, of course, but maybe you could give your answer to your mum or dad, or tell me the first time you see me. And the question is this, what is your favourite biscuit? What is your favourite biscuit? Now, in our house we have, we have lots of biscuits that we, we like. Uh, here's one here. Uh, this is a Twix. And we like Twix bars. And we like uh, penguins. And we like Kit Kat. And we like club biscuits and we like these here if you can see these these are digestive biscuits and we like these but you know there's only one thing better than a digestive biscuit and it's this it's a chocolate digestive biscuit these are really really scrummy and we love these biscuits now earlier this week amanda and i were chatting to some of our friends in america and we were chatting to them using a video call so we could hear them and we could see them and they had hoped they had planned to come and see us here next month but like us they are not allowed to travel so they won't now be coming to see us next month and we're disappointed about that but it was lovely to see them and to talk to them and one of the things they said they were looking forward to very much was sitting down with a cup of tea and a digestive biscuit. You see, girls and boys, we can get into almost any shop here and buy digestive biscuits, but they can't. In America, they are difficult to get, and when you can get them, they're really quite expensive. So our friends are disappointed that they are not going to be able to come and enjoy a digestive biscuit but this is what I did <clears throat> I went to the cupboard and I got out this packet of digestive biscuits and I held it up to the camera so that they could see them and they were so excited to see them but they couldn't taste them that was the problem they could see them but they couldn't taste them. And maybe you have a favourite biscuit and you just love them and you would eat them all the time but you're not allowed to eat them until after you've had your dinner. And, and you know that they're in the cupboard and you know what they look like but you can't taste them until you eat them and you can't eat them until you have had your dinner. And when you do get them, they taste so good. Now, here's the reason I'm talking to you about biscuits. We read a little while ago from Psalm 34. That's in the Old Testament. And in Psalm 34, David is talking about how good God is. God has been incredibly good to David. David was in trouble and God came to his rescue. God saved him from his enemies. And David was so thrilled and delighted about God's goodness that he sang. And then he said this to other people. Taste and see that the Lord is is good. Now, maybe your mum or your dad 
or your brother or your sister or your auntie or your granny or granda or, or some friend of yours is a follower of Jesus. Jesus is their special friend. And they know themselves that God is good. I suppose you could say that they, because they are God's friend, have tasted a little bit of God's goodness. And the word we use for God's goodness is grace. But here's the thing I want to tell you, girls and boys. If you want to have God as your special friend, if you want to taste for yourself something of God's goodness, you have to do it for yourself. It's a bit like these chocolate digestive biscuits. People can tell you how good they are and they are really good. But you will only know how good they are when you taste them for yourself. And girls and boys, it's just the same with God. God is so good. He is incredibly good. But if you want to know how good God is, really good he is, you've got to taste him for yourself, as it were. So how do we know God's goodness in our lives? How can we get a little taste of God's goodness? Well, we come to God ourselves, individually, and we say to God that we are really, really sorry for all the wrong that we have done. And we ask him to forgive us for our sin. And then we trust him. We take him at his word. We rely on him. And that way we can taste for ourselves just how good God is. Remember what David said after he had been rescued, after he had been saved from his enemies? He said, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I really hope that you will do that for yourself, that you will taste and see just how good God is. Now, we're going to sing your song just now. And do join in at home if you know this song.
Let's pray before we come to God's Word. Holy Spirit, you are the giver of life. You are the giver of wisdom and insight. And we ask now that you will help us as we come to God's Word to hear and understand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have ever moved house, I don't mean within the same area, but if you have ever moved house to a completely new area and you find yourself looking for a tradesman, maybe a plumber or an electrician or a painter and decorator or a, a motor mechanic, there are a number of ways you, you can go about to find a tradesman. You can go online and check on the internet. I guess if you're old school you could go and look the yellow pages. But there's no better way to find a tradesman than by word of mouth by speaking to someone else who has had first-hand experience of a tradesman and they can give you a personal recommendation and because they know the work of the tradesman they can give testimony as to just how good this joiner or this plumber is Nothing beats word of mouth when it comes to a recommendation. And in Psalm 34, David is writing a personal recommendation. Here he is talking about how God has rescued him from a very dangerous situation. And he's saying to others, look at what God is like. This is what God does. This is a God who rescues people. And David wants others to know the reality of what he has experienced. So in verses 1 to 10 of Psalm 34, we have his personal experience of rescue. He has been rescued and he tells other people about his rescue. Now, when we read earlier in the text, you will see that David came up with this scheme. He pretended to be insane and he was rescued. His scheme worked. But having been rescued from Abimelech, does David take credit himself for his rescue? Does he think that the scheme that he devised and put into action is a reason for his rescue? No, he doesn't. I wonder if you noticed how many times the little phrase, the Lord, appears in Psalm 34. 22 verses in the Psalm. And I think I'm right in saying that that phrase, the Lord, appears 16 times. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, over and over again. David here was staring death in the face. And it was the Lord who rescued him. And having been rescued, Having been released from danger, see how 
joyful he is and see how he expresses that great sense of relief at being rescued. I will extol the Lord. I will praise him. I will boast in him. I will glorify him. This is a man who knows that God has done something amazing. And he wants others to know that. And he wants others to experience that. And he wants others to join in the praise of God. Let us exalt his name together. Why? Verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Verses 6 and 7. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. David had first hand experience of being rescued and he can't keep quiet about it. Now, knowing the background to this psalm is helpful and we are impressed by God's rescue of David but perhaps then we wonder in what sense we can experience this rescue that David enjoys should we expect God to step in and save us from similar danger? Should we expect God to step in to save us from bad things happening to us? Well, there is no promise in the Bible that God will protect all believers from all trouble, all the time. In fact, Jesus himself said that we would know trouble in this world. So then, in what sense can we experience or can we taste this rescue that David enjoys? Well, for believers, there is a much deeper fulfillment of this promise of rescue. David faced physical death. And we face physical death. But we face a much more serious problem. We face spiritual death. But the good news is that we can be rescued. And when Jesus died on the cross in our place, he was taking all of our guilt. He was taking all of our wrongdoing on himself. Why? So that we could be rescued so that we could be forgiven so that our faces need no longer be covered with shame our faces can be radiant yes David received a great rescue from his enemy Abimelech but believers have received an even greater rescue. A rescue from eternal death and condemnation. And having received that, we should be joyful. We should be praising God for the amazing rescue we have received. And we should be saying to others, Taste and see that the Lord is good. This is a good God. 
This is a God of compassion, a God who rescues people. But often we don't do that. And the reason may be that we have forgotten. We have lost something of the wonder of being rescued. Now if David could say in verse 6 that this poor man called and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles, then how much more can we say that? Because we have been rescued from something infinitely worse. Rescued not just from physical death, but rescued from eternal death. Taste and see, said David, he has rescued me. So in these first 10 verses, David talks with great passion about his rescue. But he doesn't just tell us here in this psalm about his personal experience. He has something to teach us from his experience. So then in the second half of the psalm, he says, listen and learn. Verse 11, come my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So we move from David's experience to David's instruction. And David says, in the light of my rescue, this is what I want to teach you. I want you, like me, to fear the Lord. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? Well, in the Bible, to fear God means to, to hold him in honour. It means to respect his character. It means to revere him. It means to call on him. It means to acknowledge him. It means to look to him for rescue. It means to realise that God is all in all. So fear God is, is an attitude. It's a way of thinking. But it's more. Because David wants us to see that fearing the Lord is not just an attitude of the mind. It's something very practical. It's a change of living. He's saying here, having been rescued, I now must live in the light of the rescue. I need to change my life as a result. So what does fearing God mean in practice? Verse 12. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Do you see here what David is saying? He's saying that a life lived in the fear of God means a rejection of all that is evil. It means a deliberate pursuit, a conscious pursuit of all that is good, including our speech. It's just another way of saying that if you have genuinely 
been rescued by God. If you have known his forgiveness, if he has given you a new life, then it will show in how you live. And if it doesn't, that claim to be rescued is a sham. You see, a, a genuine desire to live God's way is a good sign that you have been rescued. It doesn't mean that we will be perfect, no. It doesn't mean that we won't get things wrong. It doesn't mean that we won't wrestle with sin. But it means that our hearts are devoted to him. And if our hearts are devoted to him, it will be seen in how we live. Because you have been rescued, you will desire to become more like Christ. Because you have been rescued, you fear the Lord. Your life is not governed by or by others or by family or by peer pressure. Your life is governed by God and it shows in everyday life. And that, of course, is very challenging. David here is asking those who claim to be saved to prove the reality of their rescue in everyday life. I guess what the psalm is saying, or one of the things this psalm is saying is this. How different is your life after your rescue than it was before your rescue. You say you're rescued. Where is the evidence? That's what David means by fear of the Lord. An attitude of submission to God in all of his holiness, in all of his majesty and a life lived in practical obedience to him. That's one lesson from this psalm. But there's a, another lesson or a number of lessons but one more just for now. And it's this. When we find ourselves in a difficult situation or a dangerous situation, we need as far as humanly possible to see it from God's perspective. To see the, the bigger picture, if you like. See what David says in verses 15 and 16 the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth now do you see what dif difference David makes between the righteous and the evildoers. The righteous are rescued and the evildoers will perish. Now the righteous here are not the self-righteous. No. The righteous are those who have received God's gracious rescue. And the evildoers are those who have not received God's gracious rescue. You see, God's perspective on life is this. Humanity is heading for judgment. 
and we will all stand before God. And there are only two types of people in the world. There are those who bow the knee before God and there are those who continue in their rebellion against God. But for David, being in the camp of the righteous is a wonderful place to be because God will guard and keep his people. God will vindicate his people. Life may be tough for them, but there will be an end to their suffering. So see how David ends in verses 21 and 22. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. And that's such an encouragement for believers, especially when they are facing tough times. That there is an end. That this life as we know it is only a shadow. The reality lies ahead. And if we find our refuge in him, we will not be condemned. And in the meantime, when life is hard and when we feel like David did in deep, deep need, then we have this wonderful promise of verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. What an incredible promise that in the white heat of trouble God will not abandon his people. I wonder believer are you feeling broken hearted or crushed in spirit? Well, if you are, then take this truth to heart. God is close to you and he will save you and he will bring you through. And how do we know? How do we know God will keep his promise? How do we know God will bring us through? Is God some kind of spin doctor? Is he promising more than he can deliver? No. But how do we know? We know because he has already done it. He has done it in Jesus Christ. You see, while this psalm has lots of practical lessons for us to learn, helpful lessons, this psalm ultimately points to Christ. Jesus himself is the fulfillment of this psalm. Maybe when we were reading together earlier, from the psalm you picked up on something that David said in verse 22. Let me read that to you. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Now that is a reference to Jesus, to the Christ. Listen to John chapter 19 verse 23 where Jesus or rather John is speaking about the crucifixion of Jesus for these things took place 
that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And Christ is the fulfilment of this psalm. Jesus is the righteous one. He is the anointed king of whom David was simply the forerunner. David's kingship was pointing forward to a much greater kingship. To the kingship of Christ. The truly righteous one. The one without sin. And if we are in Christ, if we are in the righteous one, then we are counted righteous in the eyes of God. Yes, God kept his promise to redeem his righteous servant, Christ, by raising him from the dead. And if we are in Christ, we too can have absolute confidence that God will bring us to eternal life through Christ. The Lord redeems his servants. Not one of them will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Amen.
us, we turn our eyes to you.